Hello, friends. It's a pleasure to see you again. Welcome back to the Gallery of Curiosities. I'm once again your humble host and caretaker, Leopold. Tonight's exhibit is a quieter piece than the usual fare. It's time for that post-Halloween melancholy that always blows through on the November winds, and it brings to mind a time for reflection. We all have scars, some seen, some unseen. And when we find someone else on our journey who can understand where our own scars came from, it feels like a port in a storm. This story is called The Peculiarity of Two by Liam Hogan. Liam is an award-winning short story writer with stories in Best of British Science Fiction and Best of British Fantasy 2018, published by Newcon Press. He's been published by Analog, Daily Science Fiction, and Flame Tree Press, among others. He helps host Liars League London, volunteers at the creative writing charity Ministry of Stories, and lives and avoids work in London. More details can be found at happyendingnotguaranteed.blogspot.co.uk. The Peculiarity of Two Written by Liam Hogan Narrated by Matt Dovey Hooded eyes stare with fierce intensity across the scarred oak table as the creature looms out of the shadows. Hmm, I had never thought to see another, he muses. I nod my glass of claret in Adam's direction. The dregs glint like drops of spilled blood in the candlelight. And from the moment I became aware, I knew of your existence, knew that we were two of a kind, knew that this day was destined to come. As if reassured, he eases back into the gloom, his chair protests the shifting weight. Then the inn, once again, lapses into silence. The few staff are long gone. There is no one to clear the tables, to refill our glasses. We refill our own. It was Adam who unearthed the handful of candles. They are less harsh than gas lamps, more forgiving. His eyes glint in their wavering light. I wonder, can Adam smile? Earlier, in a room above the one in which we now sit, beneath bright incandescent mantles surrounded by the sooty halo of their less efficient predecessors, Adam and I compared notes. Compared bodies. Adam knows little of the experiments that brought him to life, that keep him alive unto this day. I have the dubious benefit of a longer relationship with my creator. But there are mysteries still. Mysteries that decades of medical research have done nothing to illume that no doctor or scientist present today can tackle. We are forced to conclude we are as much the product of blind luck as of science. I am the neater creation, benefiting from the unstoppable advance of anatomical knowledge or merely from improvements made to Adam's earlier prototype. Adam is the stronger much stronger. A strength not explained merely by his large stature. A strength that matches his hunger. It is as though his body burns fuel at twice my rate. The no man's land of table between us is littered with the remains of our meal, barely space to rest my empty glass. Most of the dishes are his. He is, surprisingly, a vegetarian. I wonder if his diet is more or less efficient than mine, and if it is truly an ethical choice, as he claims, or some limitation of his reconstructed gut. 
It is Adam's coin that paid for our food and drink, and for this condemned inn to be exclusively ours, for one night at least. Adam shrugged my purse away. Both of us have more money than those who previously owned the hands we count our coins with could ever have dreamt. I do not ask how he came by his. He drummed solid fists on the ancient wood, shaking the scraped clean dishes, opens one hand, a hand that is maimed and killed beyond number, and looks at it as if it is a thing he has never before seen. What now? he asks the darkness. I shrug. I have no answer, and I'm doubtful the question was aimed at me. He was not an easy man to track down. He does not stay long in any one city, in any one country. It is easier to tell where he has been than where he is going. The bodies have a tendency to mount up. Mostly, they are no one anyone would miss. Adam has his own peculiar moral compass, a strong sense of justice that protects the innocent, the weak, the feeble-minded. All the things he is not. And when I did find him, more by chance than by design, I approached with extreme caution, unsure of the reception I would receive, until I had convinced him of who and what I am, unsure of my reception even once I had done so. I find myself still unsure. When first I sought Adam, I was looking for understanding, a way to live in this changing world, a guide, a mentor, a teacher. Later, as one age gave way to another, 99 rolling over with tiresome inevitability into naught, the beginning and the end, I longed for companionship, an equal, one who does not shy away from what I truly am, one who understands. And long before our unexpected encounter, a quarter of a century on from my painful rebirth, my search had turned idle and was filled only by morbid curiosity. Even at the very beginning of my quest, Adam had already lived a long life, his body having lived even longer. And yet he and it seem immune to the ravages of time. My skin is lined. I wear reading glasses. I grow old. It is unfair. Half my span was over before it even began. I carry both my years and the years of those who came before me and fear it will not be the youngest parts of me that seal my inescapable fate. What did Adam's creator do that mine did not? It is a question whose answer will surely come too late for me, if it comes at all. On some not-so-distant day, Adam will be alone once more. I wonder how he feels about that. Though, where there are two, there is a possibility for many. Two is such a peculiar number. Yesterday, he discovered he is no longer unique. It can only be a matter of time until there is a third of our kind, until there are perhaps a multitude. Outside, in the dark, narrow street, someone hammers on the boarded doors and windows of our temporary respite. Adam watches as I flinch. The sudden clamour brings back unwanted memories, though it is merely a drunk unwilling or unable to accept the scrawled We're Closed sign. It is not the first such interruption of the evening, but as the hours advance and the candles burn lower, perhaps it will prove the last. Adam sits impassive, ready and waiting. I have glimpsed the dagger he wears in his belt, have heard tell of his terrible acts of superhuman strength and of the fearsome speed at which his apparent calmness can turn to fury. For a moment, it is my turn to be reassured. Belatedly, I realise that if our space is indeed invaded, if a mob of angry men burst in here and now with axes and torches, Adam would still be sitting, impassive and waiting. Waiting to see what I would do. I fear, I hope, he would be disappointed. We were both born of violence, he and I. Our bodies did not come from those who died of natural causes. Accident or murder or the punishment the state meets out to those who fall foul of its ever-changing laws. There is always plenty of raw material. 
I know that Adam has long sought a companion. I know also that he has attempted to sire them. In this he has failed, often spectacularly. In any case, I suspect he would have been unimpressed with the results. My progeny have turned out no different from countless millions of humans. His, most likely, be the same. And he would have to watch them grow old and die. Perhaps his failure to sire offspring is the key to his longevity. Can you have children if you live forever? Can you live forever if you have children? Of course, Adam may merely be long-lived, not immortal. Methuselah, not a fallen angel. Only time will tell. Time that I do not have. There are other differences between us. Some good, some bad. For me, for him. Adam does not feel pain or not as keenly as any normal man, whereas my senses are, I am convinced, sharper than most, and this most definitely includes pain. Why is pain not considered one of the senses? It has always been a mystery to me. It is no mystery that I avoid it wherever possible. I am made up of fewer people than Adam. My head comes from a single corpse, the brain transferred extant. There are no surgical scars crisscrossing my face or scalp, except the one that traces the length of my spinal column, beginning at the nape and ending at the coccyx. In the right conditions, and with the right amount of coin, I pass for human, and have often done so. I even fell in love once, and was loved back, unlikely though that sounds. Adam did not fully believe me when I first told him we were kin. Not until I stood before him, naked in the bright gaslight, not until he traced the lines across my body with tremulous fingers. When it came to my turn, I was more assured. I ran my hands across his ragged torso with a sense of fulfilment. His scars are, of course, much older than mine. In areas, they have thickened, knotted, and there the skin still looks raw. In others, the wounds have faded over the many decades, and only my fingertips can tell where one body ends and another begins. Not all of those jagged edges are due to the bluntness of his creator's vision. Not all of them are quite so ancient. His flesh is not immune to the weapons of lesser, mortal men, nor to the injury that he himself has inflicted on it over the near century of his tortured existence. I try to look after my patchwork form with more care, avoid confrontations that could turn violent, slip by a shadow in the darkness. And yet my borrowed body, unlike his, is fading with the years. The cadavers I am formed from were not yet born when those that made Adam started their second life, and yet my hair is grey and worn short, where his is a surprisingly glossy rope of jet black, even if it grows from only one side of his mighty skull. It is an odd vanity for one so crudely shaped. In intellect, we have perhaps similar abilities, but unlike Adam, I retain vestigial memories from my former life. I learnt my second language, French, faster than my first, and subsequent research identified the Parisian pickpockets whose head and tongue I own. I sometimes doubt all of the thoughts that inhabit my skull are truly mine. Adam has been around longer than I. He has had time to learn languages from every continent, though he retains a slight Germanic accent speaking all of them. He has studied more subjects, knows more facts, experienced more events than I, than anyone. Given the opportunity which would require circumstances I cannot foresee, Adam could hold his own in discourse against any man in any society. A keen mind coupled to the accumulated knowledge of a more than average lifespan. Much of what he has learned, I am sure, he has long since forgotten. Much of it is no longer relevant. Theories ludicrous to the modern mind, proven incorrect by recent experiments. Such is progress. No doubt Adam will live long enough to see their replacements debunked as well. I think I am a disappointment to Adam, too unlike him for all that we both count among the reborn. I am less than the sum of my parts. He, somehow, is more. His strength, his durability, his longevity suggest that in putting him back together, he somehow became better than human. As if science can improve on nature. As if the god neither of us believe in could be so easily bested. I have other faults. I am too talkative where he is a man of few words. 
Our conversation stutters and stalls like a carriage propelled by two uneven engines. At first, we talked of the changes he has seen. The changes we have both seen. The marvels, the impossible feats. Men taking to the air in flimsy constructions of wood and stretched canvas. Locomotives hurtling across the country, leaping rivers and burrowing through mountains. The discovery of a new planet and of a dozen new moons. Gaslights replacing candles and, in streets and theatres, and surely one day even buildings such as this, electric replacing gas. Already, messages crackle at the speed of thought across the Atlantic via thick ropes of underwater cables. And if all of this was not fantastical enough, the dreams of mortal men play across silver screens in temples of futurity. But what good has any of it done for mankind? Cities bulge at the seams of their new workforces, enslaved to the machine. The air they breathe grows dark, laden with soot. Flames lick at the faces and souls of the desperate. Hovels reek of disease and decay. Perhaps that is too bleak. Perhaps we are through the worst of it, even as the slums that surround our meeting place are ripped down and rebuilt anew, and doctors refine their understanding of the microscopic life that causes illness. But mankind revels in finding new ways to destroy itself, and will do so again. The bright lights of science are turned to weapons, for a war that feels as inevitable as winter. Perhaps this too will cleanse. Perhaps it will merely destroy. Neither Adam nor I profess to care. It is, after all, not our battle. I will do what I can to avoid the coming conflict. I would encourage Adam to do the same, though he refuses to be drawn on the subject. Neither of our bodies are immune to bullets and bayonets and worse. Could that be what he seeks? Perhaps he will head into the heart of the coming storm and find death and destruction enough for him there. Not I. Even this island nation no longer feels safe, and an outsider is never safe in times of trouble. And we two monsters will always be outsiders. The room and the conversation have grown cold and stale. We sit in silence, lost more in the contemplation of our own existence than in each other. For all that we have said, there are volumes unspoken, perhaps unthought. Tiredness creeps up on us both. Time to go. In the darkened alley at the back of the pub, we clasp hands one last time. For the briefest moment, Adam squeezes. It is a vice that brooks no resistance, and I feel the bones of my hand grate as pain lances up my arm. I glimpse a glimmer of his wreckage of teeth, a smile, and fear for my life. Abruptly, he releases me, and I watch him vanish into the smog as I catch my breath. Dawn is not far off. I do not tarry. We shall not meet again, at least not in so public an arena. Stood beside Adams, my own peculiarities are thrown into sharper relief, and two monsters are far scarier than one. News of this encounter will spread, and people will rightly be afraid. Next time, they might be prepared, might be ready. We are all monsters when scared. And so we two reborn go our separate ways. I, to find a new reason to go on, Although, in truth, this particular quest has not been at the forefront of my mind for a long while, and our supposedly predestined meeting having now happened, I find its answers no questions, leaves me no better and no worse off than I was yesterday. And Adam? Wherever he goes, whether towards war or away from it, I suspect he will be paying close attention to me. I imagine him reading a foreign newspaper, an account of my demise, the strange body I leave behind enough to merit a photograph. I see him a few months later, shirts fluttering in an icy wind, silence before my final resting place, an unmarked grave in unconsecrated ground. Or perhaps I, or rather my mismatched bones, will end up against my wishes in some eminent anatomist's private collection, as did those of Charles Byrne and Truganina or on display in some pathology museum to medical students like Joseph Merrick, ghoulish inspiration for a future generation of doctors. 
I shiver at the thought and clutch my coat closer. It is only a week later when I am on the deck of a passenger ship bound for the Americas with the same coat once again wrapped tight around my all too mortal form that I realise neither of us mentioned the names of our long dead creators. The world is always changing. As time rolls onward with the growth of cities, there are fewer places to hide from the violence of men and mobs. But don't worry, friends. You'll always have a place to hide in the dark here at the gallery. The warmth of our stories might help sustain you in an ever-shifting world. You might even find a friend, or the parts of one. Some assembly may be required. Our reader was Matt Dovey, who is very tall, very British, and probably drinking a cup of tea right now. His surname rhymes with Dopey, but any other similarities to the dwarf are coincidence. He has short science fiction and fantasy stories all over the place. Find out more at mattdovey.com or follow him on Twitter at mattdoveywriter. And now, friends, to send you off with one of my favorite toasts with a dash of poetry. Ships that pass in the night and speak each other in passing, only a signal shown and a distant voice in the darkness. So on the ocean of life, we pass and speak one another, only a look and a voice, then darkness again and a silence. So let's fill that silence with drink. Gallery of Curiosities is produced under a Creative Commons International 4.0 non-commercial attribution, no derivatives license. Story copyrights remain with the authors. This episode was produced in November of 2021. For full show notes, visit us on the web at gallerycurious.com. It's too bad Adam had to leave so quickly, but if you think about it, in nearly every story, I guess he's always bolted.